Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco, and today I'm speaking with custom knife maker Brian Efros. Uh, Brian is someone who caught my attention on Instagram a little while back when I was just going down a rabbit hole, looking at new makers and looking at people whose work was interesting me. And then uh, come Thursday Night Knives a few years later, or maybe a year and a half later, people keep mentioning Brian Efros, Brian Efros. And uh, <laughs> well, I keep loving his knives and I figured I'd reach out to him. And I have the great honor of speaking with him uh, on this uh, episode of the podcast, 172. Before we get to Brian, I just want to say, if you like the interviews we do here, if you like Thursday Night Knives, if you like the Wednesday supplemental or the uh, knife review videos uh, that go up on YouTube, uh, please consider checking out the Patreon, uh, the old Patreon, I know. Uh, uh, we have a three, a five, and a $10 level. At the $10 level, which is called the Gentleman Junkie, you are eligible to a monthly, uh, you're entered into a monthly knife drawing. Uh, one gentleman has won twice already in the four or five months we've been doing this. So, well, let's just say your chances are good. All right. So check it out, uh, the Patreon. And uh, well, I am very excited that uh, today brings me Brian Efros. So without uh, further delay, I bring you him. You know you're a knife junkie if you're as happy as a kid on Christmas morning when that new knife arrives in the mail. Hey, Brian, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Pleasure to have you. Hey, brother. Thanks so much for having me. I'm I'm super stoked to be here. Oh, it, it's an honor. It's an honor. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, a few years back, your knives caught my eye. And and, and the one I, I believe was a recurve tanto, I think. Um uh, fixed that, blade. A possibility, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but in any case, um, you you make these beautiful knives and and they run the gamut. Uh, but in speaking with you a little bit before we started rolling, I know you're a, a musician and a producer by training way back when. So uh, tell me, how did you get into knives and and uh, tell me a little bit about your process? Yeah, absolutely, man. First of all, I want to say the little information that you had on the sky uh, on the side as you were talking earlier. Uh, that was really helpful for me as well. Give me a quick reminder. It was it was all accurate, and, uh, <laughs> and I was like, okay, I did start in two thousand. That was a little refresher. Um, and uh, but yeah, so how did I get into knives? I you know my my mom could tell you stories back before I can remember about taking me to a, a gun and knife show, and um, which is interesting. My my mother wasn't a gun person. I have no idea why she took me there. Um, but anyways, but here we are at the gun and knife show, and she would just tell me I'd just gravitate to whatever table had knives and she would have to literally drag me out of there. Um, and ever since I was a little kid that I could remember, I had a little collection of shitty pocket knives from the flea market. One of my very first memories actually was playing with my dad's Swiss army knife while he was at work and I cut my finger because <laughs> of course, and I, you know, I cleaned it off and put it back. And then I had to think of, some way to make up that I cut my finger because I couldn't let dad know I was playing with his knife. He might not let me play with it anymore. He probably shouldn't have to begin with. Um, and so I've always really as far back as I can remember, like I said, my, my mom could even go further, just had a passion for knives. Um, and, you know, when I was 16, I was on a road trip with my, uh, my uncle and cousins to New Mexico. And I bought a little, uh, Smith and Wesson, you know, folding line of lock pocket knife. And I put that in my pocket and that was my first like EDC when I was, I was 16. And I just, you know, I mean, I carried that knife around for probably six or seven years um, just with me every day. And, um, and when that knife eventually got uh, thrown away at a music festival in Tennessee, <laughs> I, Oh, that's was, a good end. <laughs> It was, well, listen, it was either walk like a half mile back to the car or just, you know, sometimes you got to just kiss something goodbye and move on. But, but after that knife, um, I was in college at the time. I kind of then just started discovering spider codes and bench maids. Um, my, my cousin, uh, Jeremy was a big influence on me early. He, uh, he was really into sharpening 
he's one of those hmm. dudes that have like you know like a collection of different japanese uh, like you know water stones and stuff and he would yeah. his jam was just sharpening and he could get knives 10 times sharper than i could today still but you know he kind of steered me in the right direction of you know like the bench made mini griptilian uh that was one of my first and i, I think that's still one of the I mean, one of the greatest, like a, an industry standard, if there was one. Um, and so, yeah, so then I kind of just got going more and more just on like a little bit nicer knives and enjoying them. Um, and then I moved to Colorado in 2007. And at that point it was, okay, I want another knife, but I want a camping knife. I'd never, I never had like a dedicated real like fixed blade camping knife before. Um, so I started looking around uh online after work I, I was a bartender at a grateful dead themed hippie bar down in oh, dude, that sounds awesome <laughs> it was we had, it was a good time um but but yeah so i'd come home from work you know you need an hour or so to kind of just calm yourself down and i was looking for a camping knife and i remember i just typed into whatever search engine it was probably google um just typed in knife just to see if something different would pop up and like the third thing that came up was knifekits.com you know, build your own knife. And, and I saw it and I was living in a little studio apartment. I wasn't in any place to try this, but, uh, but I saw it and it kind of got stuck in my head. And then I went and I bought an Ontario rat five. Uh, that was the the camping knife that I decided on at the moment. And then, uh, six months later after that, I'd moved into a house with some friends and I had a garage that was just empty. And I remember that knife kits.com and, uh, I figured, you know, for 20 bucks, if I can get an actual knife out of this, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, and I did, and I bought it and I, and basically with those is really just, you glue the handle scales on and shape them. And so I'd gone to Harbor Freight and I bought like a, a $50 one by 30 belt sander. And I still had a hand drill at the time I was drilling all my holes with that, but, but yeah, so I, I made that one knife. Um, and then I was just, you know, the itch had been scratched and it was insatiable. I just, I just knew that like, this is what I want to be doing. And I had no idea at the time, like as a living, but it was just, so I think I, you know, I built that first one. And then the next thing I did was I went to the thrift store and I bought a couple just real cheap kitchen knives and I'd kind of reprofile them and mm. regrind them and put new handles and like think that I was making them better, but I definitely wasn't. Right. Uh, <laughs> Oh, but you were fun. learning. You were, yes. you were, you were, you were making your bones. But yeah. wait, let's go back before you even attempted. Okay. Before you did knife kits, and uh, I've, yeah. I, I have done some hobby knife making myself. Um, and knifekits.com is a great site for, um, you know, for supplies and stuff like that. And, uh, <clears throat> but they also have like the actual kits, like you're saying, where, where the blades yeah. are there and everything. Um, but. Uh, what was it before you started and attempted making knives? Uh, you said since way back, what was it about the knife, the knife in general, the, the meta knife that, that kept you coming to it? Oh man, I think that was, that was a really good question. Well, I was not prepared to go deep like that. Let's, <laughs> let's go let's, deep. Let's man. dive in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. The meta question. Let's you, I think there's something instinctual about knives. I think that it's, um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't even know, but like, there was like a mystique about it. There was, you know, when you're a kid, it's also something you're not supposed to have and be playing with. So that makes you want to even more. But, um, but you know, I didn't, I don't, I never even did anything too much. You know, I'm a kid. What the hell's a kid going to do with knives? Well, you know, maybe you'll sharpen a stick occasionally. Yeah. But there was just some, some draw about the blade. Uh, it's a little bit, it can be a little bit dangerous. And then as well, I think it's, you know, it's one of our, our primal weapons, uh, mm -hmm. primal tools. I mean, it was man's first tool was, you know, a chipped flint knife scraper, you know, thing back in the, the old yeah. one hand tools period. I wrote, I actually wrote uh, like the one big paper I wrote in college. I only wrote one, um, <laughs> but it was about the origin of hominin tool use. Oh. And, uh, and yeah, and just, you know, I mean, literally the first thing that we did was smash rocks together till you get an edge and you can kind of, you know, scrape stuff with it. You could try and cut with it. And so I, I think that there's really, um, 
like a, a built in lizard brain, just love yeah. of the knife, the tool. And I've never really met anyone. I think that doesn't like knives. It's true. It's true. Uh, uh, I had a, a female martial arts teacher back in Philly years and years ago who, uh, um, on a number of occasions, someone would come in with a new knife and the whole thing, everyone would, you know, it, classes always started late anyway. And people yeah. are gathered around with the, the guy with the new knife. She was like, ah, God, guys and knives. Come on, let's go. We're not teaching knives. Let's go. You know, so, yes, I agree with you. Uh, but, you know, I talk a lot about uh, I have spoken a lot on the show about how, like, um, for me, uh, I was born in the early 70s and grew up and watched 70s TV. And then the, the TV in the 70s, there was a lot of older stuff. I saw Grizzly Adams and Daniel Boone and stuff like that when I was little, little. And uh, everyone had a Bowie knife. And I was like, well, you know, if you're a man, you know, except for my dad, you walk around with a Bowie knife on your hip. You know, that's how it is. But uh, and but now now that you talk about it, it's also that proficiency. You know, when you're a kid, you want to show that you're more than a kid. You want to yeah. show that you're capable of going to the next step. And if you can handle a pocket knife, that's probably why you're ashamed. You cut your your finger on your dad's Swiss Army knife. You yeah. wanted to show him you can handle this thing. It was an accident. Who doesn't cut themselves? But I cut all when, the you're, time. You, when you're a kid, you want to <laughs> show that proficiency. Yeah. And actually, even you mentioned I was uh, camping this summer with my my seven year old steps on Milo. And and even, you know, as a kid, I mean, we sat there and just we were slow, you know, just kind of whittling a stick. It's had a log making making kindling to start the fire. And I had because, you know, if you're going camping, you got to bring at least like 12 or 14 knives. And I kind of <laughs> had them all. I had them all laid out and I'd like do a couple cuts with one. Set that down, do a couple cuts with the other. Because, you know, you compare an edge geometry, sure. blade shapes, you know, handle contouring. And it's just fun to play with a lot of knives. Um, but he was right there next, you know, right next to me. And I'd set one down and then he would pick it up and he'd take a couple cuts and just, I mean, you don't, you don't have to, like, teach a kid to love knives. To, you know? Everyone, yeah, and – and- and girls love them too. My girls love them, and it's because they're around them. And yeah, and uh, as they get, you know, I bought my daughter uh, uh, for her for her birthday six months ago. She turned ten. I got her her first Swiss Army knife. It's you awesome. know, and 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 she's yeah. she's been great with it. And you know, uh, we go out in the woods and stuff. And yeah, you know, we don't we don't do much. We don't go camping. Uh, I have dreams of doing it, but we're we're kind of wedged in this suburban life uh, we'll for, the, one, saying, for yeah. the moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but, no, but, but so, this, you mentioned girls. I mean, this is my my wife's right here. Let's see. This is a uh, this is a custom one that I made for her for Mother's Day. Um, and and I'll tell you what, if you ever really want to see how your knives hold up to use, um, give it to my wife. She <laughs> she she doesn't. She will use this for whatever. She doesn't. You know, a lot like my friends, my customers, they're they're a little careful. You know, mm -hmm. some. I, I try and use my knives freely without anything, but but my wife Anne, um, and and it's great. I mean, I've had to resharpen this more times than I've had to sharpen my own that I've been had for a couple of years. She just uses it, and whether she's in the garden, whether she's in the kitchen, she just grabs it and uses it for whatever she needs a knife for, and it's really perfect. I love it. I got to say, man, and any woman who EDCs a Brian Efros is a keeper, I'd say hold oh, yeah. on to her. She's got uh, as, good as tight as I can. <laughs> but yeah, this was, uh, so yeah, this was actually, so it was my hustle model. And then I did, uh, that model usually has a Tonto blade shape. And I, I wanted hers to be a little special. So I did the drop point. And this is the only, the only one like it this is the, the drop point hustle so far. And she, you know, she needed a little bit of, little bit of color so we got yeah. some white Damascus on the backspacer and clip for um and then a little cool hole pattern okay yeah. oh god okay so you're holding no hold that back up please <laughs> so yeah. you're holding up this beautiful masterpiece that that uh is actually living it's the life it should be living oh yeah it, it's it's not it's sitting in a safe it's getting thrown into a bag it's getting used in the garden it's it's and getting i, all I actually you mentioned a specific i sorry i don't mean to interrupt no 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 please but i i made the detent on this a bit stronger than i normally do because i specifically envisioned her just tossing it in her purse or whatever and you <laughs> don't want it yeah. to you don't want it to open up at all 
And so I, I usually, I like my detents where you can open it nice and slow with your thumb. Mm -hmm. Wait, sorry, the camera's moving, moving backwards. But, uh, but yeah, this one is is real snappy just because I made that that detent a little bit stronger for her just because you don't want don't want it to open up when you don't want it to open up. Okay, so let's talk about how you went from that first knife kits yeah. kit to this to this beautiful titanium uh, frame lock uh, folder that you were just holding up. How how did that uh, tell us about that? Yeah, so I have very little background, zero background in machining, woodworking. I, I took like auto classes in college, or I'm sorry, in high school, um, mainly because cars were cool and it got me out of having to go to like actual class and i learned so i learned some useful shit or stuff i'm sorry um but but so i, I had very little experience and I, so i bought the knife kits kit and then um like i said i just knew i needed more and so then i bought the cheap knives from the, from the thrift store and kind of turned those around and then from there what ended up happening was my cousin jeremy who i mentioned earlier uh, turned me on to the the website knifeforums.com, which is no longer around. But but back in the day when I first started, it was a it was a pretty hopping place, and I kind of hopped on there. And there's you know there's always a newbie section on all the knife forums, and you know honestly with the, and the forums don't really seem to be around as much anymore. You know just they have a hard time competing with the ease of access of yeah. general social media, but they would all have a newbies forum, and that was that was huge for me, like a place where you could go and ask the dumb questions and not feel like an mm -hmm. idiot. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's a, that's an important thing being able to ask a dumb question that like, you know, is dumb, but you still need the answer. Um, and so I, I'd go there and, um, and I, someone, I don't even remember who it was. I was just asking about knife steel and I was, you know, people would make knives from files mm -hmm. and that never made sense to me why a beginner would do that because that's so much extra work i feel um, yeah because right. steel is cheap and, and it comes soft you know a file is hard yeah and you have those very deep grooves you gotta grind it away just, it really i mean i i understand why sometimes you're like oh a file is just cheap and i'm not i'm not gonna be like wasting money by buying steel i'm not good enough maybe people think but i think in reality i mean for 10 bucks you can buy you know, you can buy a piece of yeah. steel and it comes nice and it'll generally be, you know, flat ground or something like that. Well, well, well no doubt the making knives from files and from lawnmower blades came from a probably a different time where access wasn't as, as easy. But Absolutely. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, but, but, but you said making a knife out of a file, like, why should I do that extra work? And then so what? Yeah. It just, yeah. Um, and absolutely no knock to anyone that's making knives out of files. I was just lazier. They're actually doing more work. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I kind of learned um, f through the newbie section of, okay, so I just went and bought a bar of steel. And I'm like, we have to cut it. So I go to Harbor Freight and I buy a little like handheld angle grinder. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you, you know, and I just literally, I just draw on the piece of steel, something that was like the shape of a knife. And, um, and I, I, I at least had an idea of what a knife should look like. I feel because I had been kind of collecting and using them, you know, I was, my, my first designs were all pretty simple. Um, but, but yeah, so yeah, I just draw it and, and cut it out with an angle grinder and I'd use my, you know, $50 Harbor Freight one by 30 to get a general profile. And, um, and then I was like, you know, you have to heat treat it. And again, you know, I I built like a horrible little forge out of a Weber grill in my backyard and I would like heat treat myself. Oh. Um, and I almost burnt the house. I burnt, I lit a tree on fire one time. <laughs> it was really, it, you know, I should have just sent him out because there's people that do it professionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the results are predictable and consistent. But, you know, maybe it was a little bit of that that file mentality. I didn't think I was good enough back then to warrant sending it out to someone or just, but yeah. Or, so maybe, but, or maybe you thought I'm making a knife. I'm going to make a knife. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm lazy. That's not, that <laughs> okay. is not. All right. That's not, uh, but, uh, but yeah. And so, so really I just, um, I just kind of just went for it. I really, 
you know, I, I bought the kit so I knew how to glue on a handle. Mm-hmm. You know, I had no idea about grinding a blade, but I just you press it into the belt sander and I mean it wasn't good, but it worked ish and uh and I just kind of I went for it. You know, I was working at the Grateful Dead bar. I was in my twenties, I was single, I didn't even have a dog. And so, you know, back then you have a lot of time to experiment with stuff. Yeah, yeah. And um and so I'd been doing it for a couple months and learning from people on the uh, that knifeforms.com website. Uh, and actually, uh, Jerry Hossam was one of the guys who would hop in the newbie section all the time and answer questions for me. And actually, I still um, even do a lot of the – I don't know if you can see it on this knife, but the spine is rounded. Uh-huh. Uh, sometimes people call it crown or, or rounded. Right. But, but literally, you know, I, one of my knives, the edges were real sharp because if you just leave them at a perfect 90 degrees, that yeah. back spine will be sharp. So you put your thumb on it and it might cut you and that sucks. Yeah. And so in the newbie section, I, I put up a post. I'm like, Hey guys, what do you do to combat this? And, and Jerry Hassan just replied, anytime that I'm not doing a double edge knife, I round the spine by just pressing it into the a slack belt with no tool rest behind it. And he goes, you just wiggle it, just wiggle it, flip it over, wiggle it the other side. And that's it. Now, Jerry Hossum is a legend in the yeah. knife making world. And he, he, I mean, I know him for some very unique handles that look uh, counterintuitive, but also yes. if you've, if you've ever held one, you know, how, how beautifully they actually fit in your hand. And, and then the same thing with his crazy, uh, blade shapes. I mean, a, an extremely accomplished custom knife maker, but coming to the forum and talking to the hoi polloi, such as yourself, that's pretty oh, yeah. awesome. He, and, and, and it was one of the things that when I was talking to him, I knew he was like on that level too. Not, not that I was like super familiar with the, the, com- the knife community, but you know, you could just tell, you look at his work, you, you search his name and it really, you know, the fact that there was people that were on that level that were willing to just talk to a, a noob and, and, and just help him out was something that wasn't lost. And, uh, and that, and that made it all the more fun and cool. So where, where were you at this time? Where were you living? I was in Denver. Denver. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up in Michigan, went to Michigan State out there, and then afterwards um, just kind of needed to find a place to get an apartment and a job, and uh, I wasn't really into Detroit at the time, and so I was like, let's go move to where, you know, we like to go on vacation, so I moved to Colorado, <laughs> and uh, nice. yeah, I moved to Colorado, I got a job at the Hippie Bar, started playing in a band and making knives. Playing in a band. So we talked about this. You're a bass player. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, I got it stashed right over there on the side. I unfortunately don't get to play nearly as much as I would like to. I don't get to play at all anymore. Um, well, well, you know what? Uh, really, I think that's maybe part of adulthood. Uh, yeah. when, when you're a creative person, oftentimes you have a lot of different things that capture your attention. For me, I've always been in a sine wave. Uh, in and out of 2D art, painting and drawing, painting and drawing. That's what I went to school for. But then I go into writing and then I go into filmmaking and then maybe I try knife me. But it I, it always comes back to the drawing aspect. And um, mm. so, I mean, I think that's, you can have one thing. And when you're an adult and you have other responsibilities, it's like you can have one thing that you can get yourself really good at. Yeah. And, and, and knife making satisfies that. I mean, I miss being on stage. There are a few things that feel better than being on stage with your bass and making a whole room of people just dance. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. But, um, but once knife making came into my life, I was really ready to just put that at the forefront. Um, and, you know, I'd been making knives for probably about a year and I was just, I would give them away to friends. I would uh, keep, I have a bunch of them somewhere in a box and uh, the idea of, of selling them was not even in my head because I just assumed that no, they weren't very good and nobody would want to buy it. But I posted a picture of one in like a group chat on uh, on that knife forums. And someone was like, well, how much do you want for that? And I was like, well, I'm not really selling it. They're like, but if you were to sell it, how much would you want for that? 
I was like, I don't know, 80 bucks. And they're like, all right, what's your, they're like, what's your PayPal address? I'm like, I don't have one. And so I went and I signed up for PayPal and then they sent me 80 bucks and I was like, Whoa. Their note like, was sucker. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but, uh, but I, I really, there was like a, like a light came on, you know, and it was like, wow, I could sell these. And, yeah. and I was like, that's, that's awesome. And at first it was just selling them to, to support the habit, you know, um, hobby habit, whatever you call it, addiction. Um, and I would, you know, I, I was actually working at the bar and I would sell most of my knives to my customers at the bar. Cool. And I would just make little like neck knives for, and you'll know, sell them for 50 or 60 bucks. And, you know, one of my, uh, one of my customers owned like a dent repair company and he wanted to get something cool for all of his guys for Christmas. So he hit me up with an order for like 10 neck knives. And I'm like, I'm like, they're like 60 bucks a piece. He's like, I know. I'm like, you want, you know how much it's going to cost for me to make 10 of them? He's like, yeah, I know how much that's cost. I'm like, okay, you're willing to give me this much money. eh? idiot but um but yeah and those, and those guys now are walking around with they yeah. might not even know what they're walking around with i know they're, to they're you, not the prettiest. It's, it's old work yeah. but it's still your young it's um, your early days but uh but yeah and then it was then i realized i was like man if i really hustle i could you know do this as a living and at that point i put everything into it man i you know, I, di I didn't have a lot of money. I was bartending, you do okay, but it was I didn't have a bunch of money to throw in the shop, but it was like every decision that I made in my life was hopefully to get me towards the goal of being where I am now. You know, I, I work at the bar for a long time and working there gives you a lot of time during the days and on the weekends to, you know, further your craft. And then, uh, and then I got fired. They said laid off, but I think it was kind of fired from the bar after five and a half years. And, um, and I got, I, I eventually ended up with a job as an arborist. I was climbing trees and pruning trees and cutting them down for a living. And that sucked because I'm afraid of heights. Um, but I needed a job and the work day there ended at three. So I could like go to work, use my chainsaws and climb trees and then come home, grind it out for an, you know, an hour or two. Mm -hmm. before it was you know time for dinner or whatever and then the weekends and i and i really just um i just always worked to keep this goal as my main um what i was working for you know i never lost sight of it so as someone who who was a very serious musician for a while and and you're someone who understands the value of practice um yeah. to 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 be able to pull it out in the moment of truth when it's actually needed. Um, how has that skill and how has that, uh, you know, value of practice translated into knife making and knife grinding? Um, you know, one of the things that I would say as far as practice is a lot of times I, li I like to go on Reddit a lot and there's like, there's, there's a lot of, you know, real new knife makers that are like, posting up pictures of stuff that they're like, it's the first knife that I wasn't too ashamed to share. And I always like to hop on there and just be like, dude, it's don't be ashamed of that. But what you got to do is just keep grinding. Like if you need to grind 10 blades and throw them all away just to learn to get better at grinding, it's worth it. Because I didn't, you know, there wasn't knife making school tuition. I couldn't go. And I mean, I guess there are places you can go and people will teach you, but I just, you know, I figured, like if I just keep doing it and if they suck, I'll just throw them away and make another one. Eventually you get decent at it and kind of learn what you're doing. Um, and then as well, you know, while music it hasn't, it's hasn't been like a, a direct, um, it's not like the skills haven't directly translated, you know, I music is such an inspiration. So many of my knives are named after, music or songs and you know i i have my headphones going for eight hours a day in the shop and it's i mean there's nothing better than just putting on your headphones and like you know that you get that right song at the moment and it could be anything i love and it, but but you just forget about everything else in the world and it allows you to focus on what you're doing and what i was doing at the time was grinding knives 
And so, you know, the, the practice for music, right? Like it's, it of course applied because you need to practice at anything. You're not just going to be good, especially me. I'm not like good at things. You have to really work. Um, and so like that translated, but then as well, just the ability to listen to music and not think about all the crap going on, but just hear what's going on mm-hmm. in your headphones, see what's going on 12 inches in front of your face. Uh, that, that allowed me to really focus and, um, and just, just keep grinding. And I ground a lot of plays. So when, when do you reach the point? I mean, cause this is something uh, across the board and all the arts and we're talking about music too, but uh, it, it it's it works there too. What when do you know when you're knife making that you've reached the point where you get rid of the uh, get rid of the old 32 by one inch grinder and you sink in the money and you start really getting equipment? Um, and, and how much? And and actually, let me ask you this: How much does yeah. the equipment mean? How much of it is talent and skill? How much of it is equipment? Well, so I got rid of the old one by 30 and I graduated to a Grizzly one by 42. And then, um, you know, I, I worked on that for a year, a couple years, uh, until the switch burnt out, it just stopped working. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not good at like fixing things. So it's just, we got to buy a new one. Um, (laughs) and so I actually borrowed money from a buddy of mine and he, he loaned me 1500 bucks to buy my first grinder. And I'd been doing it for about three years at that point. Um, and I bought just kind of a pretty basic KMG, just kind mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, there wasn't, wasn't a variable speed motor. Um, I did when I bought it, it didn't even, I didn't even buy a contact wheel. I, it only came with the flat platen. Um, and so it was a, it was kind of a gradual slow progression of building up and buying tools. And, you know, a lot of it was, not even knowing I needed something like when I got a blast cabinet, cause I'd seen a buddy use one, I blasted something and I was like, Holy crap. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, yeah. And it, it was just kind of one of those things where it's, and it's still evolving, you know, I'm still on the hunt for a little more, uh, heavy duty, sturdy milling machine. And I'm always on the hunt for the next, you know, a good disc sander. And it's, yeah, it's kind of just like a gradual progression. And as well, you know, you'll you'll have a need that needs to be filled. Like mm-hmm. if I'm like I'm I'm profiling these blades and it's taking forever and there's not a great selection of belts. And you know, on the this this one by forty two I was using. And so it was kind of to the point where, you know, I was working in that shop a lot, all my free time, and I, I realized how much quicker and more efficient it would be if I had a machine that allowed, you know, ran was just more controllable and more power. Um, and so then your second question, the, the, how much does the, the machine make uh, an impact a tremendous amount? Um, but I don't, so like the difference between like a one by 42 and a two by 72, kind of the standard grinder is the two by 72. Uh, for the, the the knife making, um, and so when you go from the one by forty two to that bigger two by seventy two, it's like night and day. But now I've got a couple different two by seventy two machines. I still have that original KMG I bought, mm-hmm. and you know I also have a TW ninety, um, a, a, a nicer machine that can do you know a lot more stuff. It's very versatile. And while that new one allows me to do some things quicker and easier, um, it doesn't make me a better grinder, I feel. Uh, yeah, sure. Just, <laughs> yeah, that know, makes sense. Yeah, like, like I, so like, you know, when you, when you jump up from, like I said, the maybe the, the beginner equipment to the more professional grade stuff, it absolutely makes a big difference. And uh, it just, you know, when you have a bigger surface with, I mean, I would press into the belt and it would stop, you yeah, know, like yeah. it was <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah. it, it really, um, that, that wasn't, wasn't great. And so, like I said, when I jumped up to the bigger, the bigger machine, it made a pretty noticeable difference pretty quickly. And as well, just the variety of belts and how long they last, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. that all, that all factored in. 
Um, and then, like I said, when I got my TW90, I mean, I love it. I use it for almost everything. It's it's great. But I don't know if having, I wouldn't say that having that nicer machine made me a better grinder. Okay, so uh, something, a, a through line uh, from the knives you were showing me, like the the ice or the hustle, something something uh, new, titanium frame locky. Yeah. Uh, the through line from that to the very first knives you're making is grinding, grinding the blades. But yeah. there's there's a very obvious uh, point where you started making frame locks and milling titanium. That that's a whole other world. Yes. Right? It is. So um, how 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 does one make that? Not how does one? How did you make that jump? from from your own from fixed blades yeah. to frame locks so i'd been making fixed blades for seven years before i made a folding knife and um i liked making fixed blades because i was comfortable making fixed blades and i'm not a person that's really great all the time at jumping out of their comfort zone um but what i would do is i knew eventually i wanted to make folding knives because i love folding knives and i feel a folding knives is just much easier to carry on a daily basis. Um, I made tons of small little fixed blades because I could carry them around in my customers. You know, you could just drop it in your front pocket yeah. or, you know, put a little belt sheath, however. And so I've made a lot of smaller fixed blades, but, but ultimately I knew I always wanted to make folding knives. And so what I would do is I would start incorporating into my fixed blades elements that I thought would be applicable to folding knives. Um, and so just simple things like using removable hardware for the handles, mm -hmm. right? Like, so at first I would always, um, you know, I would epoxy pin, and it, pin all my knives together. Yeah. But then I'm like, okay, let's, let's try using, um, screws to hold it together. And I mean, it's not a difficult thing to do or like a big, huge leap, but it's, but it requires more precision. It does. It yeah, it requires more precision and like counter boring. You have to figure out because if you don't know how, you have to figure out how to counter bore so that the screw head will sit flat. Um, so I started doing that and then I started making a couple friction folders. Um, and, you know, the thing with the friction folder was okay, now I'm working with a pivot and mm -hmm. you got a stop pin. And maybe I would tap, you know, t cut some threads. And so those, um, those I and I didn't make a ton of them, maybe like seven total ever. And there's but a lot of consideration as to where you put the pins. It's and it's different, it's, right? Yeah. From a locking knife, it's got. Yeah, yeah. The 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 geometry of the mechanics are very very different, and like the location of the stop pin. Um, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, buddy came over and we're like, yeah, let's just figure out how to do this together. And he kind of just, you know, and I would look at a picture of one and I'd say, okay, it looks like they kind of have it here. And you get a couple pieces of cardboard and just kind of see if it works. And eventually I found something that, that did work. And what I would kind of do is I'd make a blade shape and I'd leave like a big square handle. And then once I had the blade, I'd kind of remove from the handle so that it still worked and the blade wasn't sticking out the bottom, but it was comfortable to hold on to. So uh, do you use CAD? I don't. I am. Uh, I would like to. I'm. I couldn't. I could draw like a square. I. I couldn't draw a knife in CAD. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. So let me let me ask you this question. This this might sound like an incredibly modern first world question, but how does one make a titanium frame lock folder with the tolerances that are expected from the modern buyers uh, without CAD? How does that work? <laughs> well. Um, I just sketch my knives on a piece of paper and, um, and, and I, you know, and then I'll use a copy machine to make copies of it and I'll kind of like put a pin where I think the pivot should be and I'll rotate, you know, I'll like cut them out with scissors, the sketches, and I would kind of, you know, rotate them around to see if it would, it would work. And if it wouldn't work, you just put the pin in a different hole and, and eventually when you found it, you're like, all right, that's where the center of the pivot needs to be. And um, so, e yeah, every knife that I make starts as just a sketch on a piece of paper. And then once I have a finalized sketch, I transfer, I, ju I just make copies of it 
and I use spray adhesive and I glue it to a piece of plastic. And then I, I shape the plastic on the grinder and that's my template. And on that piece of plastic, it's got a location marked out for the pivot and a location uh, marked out for the uh, stop pin. And, um, and I just start with those things. And then I, I shape the working area of the blade. So the, the part you don't see, I shape each one of those individually to fit each knife. Um, and they're, I mean, within a model, they're generally pretty similar, but if you took a blade, if you had two knives of mine, the same model that looked exactly the same and you tried to swap the blades, mm -hmm. it, it would not work It'd at all. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let me interject and just say like, I, I love that. And, and it really appeals to, I'm a, I'm very much a pen and pen and paper, pencil and paper kind of guy. Yeah. Um, and, but, uh, I definitely, I mean, I make, I make my living with computers and editing and stuff like that. So I, I appreciate, I appreciate the utility and, and, uh, the power. I mean, I'd love that. to be able to design knives. And but I love that you can do it and make knives that, uh, yeah. aficionados are willing to spend top dollar for, but yeah. you can do it um, without that. To me, that, that, that means something. Well, and as well, the guys that I learned from that, this is how they do it as well. The, you know, there's really, there's really been two main teachers of my, my folding knife um, career or whatever we'd like to call it. But there's really been two, two people that have uh, taught me this and, uh, and, th and that's, and this is how they do it. Um, and so, you know, when I was learning, this was really the only way that I knew how, and luckily, um, I'm not good at computers anyway, so it wasn't, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it just kind of, I, I don't know. It, it just, uh, maybe I'm, I'm drawing inferences that are, that are overdone, but I mean, to me, you know, um, just maybe it's a generational thing and, and, but also the appreciation for, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what I'm saying. I just love that you do it in pen and paper oh. and you just kind of, and you kind of hack it out and that, and yeah. that each one, I don't mean kind of hack it out, but that each one is it's its own particular knife and you can't yeah. swap parts. To me, there's something no. beautiful about that. Cause they're all, you know, they're all unique. Yeah, you definitely, uh, you could. And, and like I said, even times, you know, you put two of my knives next to each other that are the same model and there will be, minor differences maybe one curve is a teeny bit more pronounced mm. or one point might be a, a teeny bit rounded a lot of it is uh oh, sometimes kind of how i'm feeling so jim can you hold it right there i mean look at those materials what are we looking at that, that was a sweet i love that knife I still do love that knife and then well that was the first knife that i ever had professional photos taken of um so the knife that's that's my hustle model um, the handles are black Timascus. Uh, they're, they're, the handle scales are black Timascus over titanium liners. The pocket clip and backspace are the same material. And the blade is um, uh, Chad Nichols' uh, Intrepid pattern, uh, mm. stainless Damascus. That was uh, that was an auction knife from the, the gathering uh, two years. Was it one year ago or two years ago? I think it was one, yeah, la last year at the gathering. Um, that, that's, that's, that's a good one. That's my jive model right there. Um, beautiful. and you see, it's got the same hole pattern as this one that I built for Ann. I, I love that, that, that hole pattern. Um, that's just a side note. It's not important. You'll notice that uh, no, one. Right no, 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 see, no. see that one right there has got the same hole pattern in it too. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was, I was actually thinking of an ex-girlfriend who used to draw circles that would come and go in size and shape and, and that reminds me exactly of it so people the, have compared it to like a sine wave or like the moon pattern that knife right there that you just scrolled by i actually have right here the motown uh, or no uh, uh this one right there the paragon oh the paragon um, yeah that's a collaboration with uh jvo design jared van otterloo up in oh, canada yeah, yeah. Um, he works a lot with uh light greg lightfoot up there. he he works a lot with a lot of people, he is one of the most talented knife designers. Working with him was a, a true pleasure. Because I could be like, "What if we just tried this?" 
And then he comes back and just like nailed it. Um, <laughs> you mean Motown? Like yeah, that's uh, my jam right there. That. Uh, so yeah. okay, I'm looking at these beautiful knives. I, I see this uh, the the shape of them. I, 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 okay, so what I like something that I like about these knives is that they have an aggressive profile but they have such um beautifully labored over and considered you know when you when you can see the surface and see the materials so what what is the purpose of these knives for you i mean like when when you see them when you're making them and you imagine them going out into the world what do you see them doing i in my mind i build utility knives um i when i when i you know I, I spent a lot of time, you know, seven years making fixed blades. And when you're making fixed blades, ergonomics is more important than in folders. I said it. I think it's true, though. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, when, when you're buying a fixed blade knife, you don't have to worry about it opening or closing, having good action. You worry about does it cut and does it feel good in your hand? Um, and so... So yeah, so I try and design, you know, and I try and continue that through my folders is, you know, a comfortable knife in your hand to use to cut shit. Um, and, you know, they're they're aggressive in times because I that those lines appeal to me and I think they're sexy. Um, and, you know, and, and could they be weapons? Of course, you know, as, I mean, I saw someone get under the driver one time and that's not gonna be a good knife and it stabbed the fuck out of that guy um and so i do you know i i make it strong so that if somebody was you know like my my ice model that's pretty that's reasonably stabby yeah um, it's beautiful and so like you know i i do make it strong and i do consider things like if you were to you know thrust penetrate you know your hand's not going to slip forward onto the blade I do make it so that if you were to pull back, the knife will come with you. You know, those are things I consider, but but ultimately, you know, I want to be, I want, I, I make knives that you you know you just use when I, I want to be when somebody wants to use a knife and cut some stuff, I want them to use my knife. Yes, and carry it like to me, yeah. they're the kind of knives that you want. Uh, they're they're like they're legacy items. They're luxury items for sure, and 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 if you have a mind to spend your money on that kind of a luxury item, which I certainly do, uh, to me, like that, that's what that's for. I mean, yeah. everyone needs a knife. It's it's presumed. I, yeah. I assume everyone needs a knife. But man, if you're going to carry something every like day, and you, or three, or a number <laughs> of them, but if you're going to carry something every day, and you and you have the the scratch to do it and you, and you have the taste and the interest. Yes. Uh, and, and everyday carry. And of course you can turn anything into a weapon if you, if you need yeah. it. I wasn't, uh, wasn't necessarily trying to lead you into the weapon realm, but the aggressive lines, it's like a Corvette or a, a sports car. You look at a, you look at a Corvette and you're like, that, that's a, that's a, that's a sweet sports car. You're not thinking that's an Indy 500 car. Yeah. You know? yeah. Thinking that's a sweet sports car. Same thing with your knives. You look at it like, aggressive beautiful lines but you don't look at it and think murder weapon you think <laughs> you think like yeah. beautiful accoutrement for a, a lady or a gentleman to pull out and use when they need it and have and it, it the rest of their lives and send it and, and enjoy it you know like it's it's a piece of it's a small little piece of art that you can put in your pocket as well you know it's people you know sometimes like there's 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 maker friends of mine that don't like the the idea of a safe queen Right, like a knife that doesn't doesn't get used. I I I would I make all of my knives to be used. Mm -hmm. However, when somebody gets one of my knives, and they they really just enjoy it so much that they don't want to to scratch it up, like I and but they still get the enjoyment out of it. You know, yeah. you can sit there and you mm -hmm. can open it and you can you can hear the sound it makes and you can feel it and maybe you could try cutting. I don't know if they they ever cut anything with them, but like. You know, there's there's a I, I appreciate when somebody likes my stuff that much that they don't want to use it. But then at the same time, I offer free spa treatments for every knife that I make, regardless if you're the original owner or not. 
because I want people to use them and not be afraid to use them. Right. Oh, and I yeah. figure that's the only way um, to, to do it. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a great way to do it. Offer a free spa treatment, whether it's you're the original owner or not, because yeah, I mean, you know that when you have a Brian Efros knife in hand that it's a capable thing, but you might not be so quick to use it. Yeah. But if you know you could have it refurbed, yeah, like, scratch that shit up. Yeah, all dirty. Use Let's it, do use this. It. But but let me let me also offer a. Uh, uh, you, you were talking about different scenarios that a safe queen might exist in, and and there is something to be said. And I'm sure I'm quite sure that there are plenty of nerds out there who will agree with me that there's something about seeing a knife, whatever knife, uh, you know, because presumably every knife in your collection is one that you obsessed over at one time and then you finally acquired. Seeing it in uh, rank and file with the other knives is exciting. Oh, there's my Brian Efros sitting right next to my blah, 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 whatever oh, that is. Um, that's that's another thing to have uh, to have a to have a knife ra round out a, a time and knife history and also like a, a uh, an aesthetic. And and from what I've heard from a, a few of our Thursday Night Knives people, um, one in particular, your knives are awesome. I have not currently I have not experienced them yet. Let's show them. We've we've been talking for almost an hour. Before we wrap, I want yeah. I want people who are watching and not just listening to see some of what we're talking about. All right. Well, I've got a few uh, here in front of me. It was funny. A, a few of them are actually customers. They're not mine. But um, let's start with a couple of fixed blades just because we were talking yeah. about that. So this was one. It was called the Off-Broadway. But just a small um, a small little guy that you can kind of carry in your pocket or, or on your belt. And it's just a fun little knife to cut with. Um, and so when I was making fixed blades, a lot of them were small little guys like this. Um, so do you, I'm going to interrupt you. Do you yeah, not sure. make fixed blades? Do you have a plan to like have, uh, uh, have someone else make these or? I, I, I don't. Um, actually, that's a perfect transitional question because the next fixed blade I'm going to pull. So I, I do make mostly folders. The vast majority are folders. However, Fixed blades with a metal guard is like, you know, it's something I've always loved and <laughs> always wanted to learn. But like I said earlier, I'm not good at doing things I don't know how to do until recently. A good buddy of mine, Nick Swan, challenged a couple of us uh, knife maker buddies just for fun to a little uh, fixed blade with a metal that's guard build. Off. That's beautiful. Loveless kind of thing. Yeah. That's yeah. And um Oh, man. And literally he gave me like eight days to have it done. So I didn't have time to order the proper materials to do. So this metal guard, while it would normally be like nickel, silver, or brass, this is actually made out of quarter inch thick titanium. Oh, um, sweet. And, and I had to use, what's that? Nothing. I'm sorry. Keep okay. turning it, it as you talk. Is, but yeah, but I ended up, I had to use like uh, pivots, pivot screws to hold it together and, you know, I couldn't solder the guard on the traditional way because I, I just didn't have time to order it and get the materials in. And so this was what I came up with. And I love this knife. And actually, um, just earlier uh, last week, Boker reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested in doing a collaboration on this knife. And so I uh, I right told him. on, man. I, I, was, I was so stoked. So excited about that. Um, I do have another project in the works with them and I'm, I'm very excited about that as well. But, but when they, when they were interested in this, it really tickled me. Um, oh, so I, I told them that over the winter, I'm going to be getting supplies in and, and learning just how to get even, you know, just better at this. And so, um, so while I do make mostly folders, you can definitely expect to see a few of these, uh, these fixed blades with this metal guard. I got to come up with a name for this guy. Um, not good at that part. Of this. So do they, I, I understand that's a very difficult part of the process, but uh, hold that knife back up, please. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll ask this question, which is, are they, um, obviously it's a beautiful profile and obviously it's a very useful looking knife. Um, <laughs> excuse me. It does have the hallmarks of, a folder, as you mentioned, it's got the it's got the pivots uh, yep. holding, holding on the and and then 
the guard, as you mentioned, you couldn't, you, you didn't have time to get the solder. So it yeah. looks like you've got T8s or T10s that's, or something. Yeah, that's exactly it. There's just some regular, I mean, if, uh, so it's, if you, it's all, it, if you look at the screws, they're, it's the same, yeah. same screws being used there. Yeah. So, so it's a fixed blade, a very traditional looking, almost loveless style fixed blade in the language, in the modern vernacular of like folding, uh, folding knife is that what Boker is hot on? It do they like, or or is that a, a feature that's not uh, important? Is it more the profile of the knife and that's it? I have no idea. Um, huh. <laughs> what I, what I'll do? I'll make well, my my plan is is to make a few more of them uh, over the winter. Just, you know, like just this one. Yeah. Well, um, I'm gonna do some like this. I want to do some with you know a soldered brass guard yeah. and a, a nice clean hand rub. I love hand rubs. Um, and then, you know, I'll just send the pictures over to them and let their design team kind of, you know, whatever, whatever they think is going to serve them best and uh, sell best. Because, you know, when you're when you're a company on that level, you got to you got to put that first. Um, yeah. One thing I will say, I did a fun little touch. I did zirconium pivot collars around the pivot screws. I don't know if that's going to come through or not. Uh, yeah, but, I can uh, see them now. But just as a little, you know, it was a, it was a build off a challenge, so I had to try and throw what I could. A little touch of class. <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right. So those are the two fixed blades I brought, and then I brought this knife, which is a very special knife to me. Um, this knife. This is my fire model. This was the first folder model that I came out with. But this was the very first one. Um, and I built this in Sean Kendrick's shop with him. Oh. And um, and he is who taught me how to make a folding knife. I came home, I came home from I was in his shop for a week, and I came home with this and like four pages of notes. Um, and and you know, I, I've said I'll never sell this knife before, I'll never sell that knife before. I sell them all. But um, <laughs> but not this one. But not this one. This one is um, this one's a, a really special uh, knife to me. The only other one that I wasn't going to sell was the knife that I wore during my wedding, um, but that got lost at a movie theater uh, one time. I was wearing some real thin pants, and the pocket clip wasn't as tight. And so sometimes I'll have people say, "Brian, your pocket clips are a little bit stiff." I'll say, "I know." Because I would rather you not lose your knives because I lost mine. Yes. Um, oh. So, um, but yeah, but so this is uh that's my fire model, and that was that was my first model, and uh, and like, I, I don't I, I, yeah I don't even carry this anymore. It just it just do you do you still make that model? I don't. I have okay. retired that model. It. I, I tried. I tried doing like a V two and kind of bringing it back, uh -huh. but I just felt the uh, the aesthetics of it weren't quite in line with the newer stuff that I was making. Yeah. I, I, well, I mean, I was going to say, it's not a surprise yeah. that, that you made that in Sean Kendrick's shop. Cause it, it, it has a little bit of that feel that recurve and the aggressive sort of look. I, I love yeah. his knife designs. Um, uh, but yeah, this, this looks like a little bit of a proto Ephros to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and it, it was, and he's, he's one of my favorite, designers makers and people and and he taught me so much i mean i remember i was back down there a different time and he was grinding a damascus blade and at one spot it got just a teeny bit too thin for him and i saw him look at it and then look at me and just throw it in a scrap pile on the floor and it was really like if if something is not perfect hmm. and like and not even like yeah it's close enough to perfect if something is not right, it's so much better just to scrap it and start over than, I mean, and sometimes of course, of course, you, you know, we have to do this to feed ourselves. Yeah. So, you know, every teeny little thing, like some things you can easily fix, but in general, yeah. if something ain't right, it doesn't leave the shop. Okay. Um, so, so you, you, you use the word perfection and before the word popped into my mind, uh, back when we were talking about music, and there's something about, you know, in 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 a in a performance, you know, playing music. Uh, what you might screw up, you might play a wrong note, whatever. You can make up for it in the next moment, 
and the moment is forgotten. Yeah. And, 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 and the perfection that you achieve making music is, is temporal unless you're recording it. With a knife, it's recorded for thousands of years, man. And so, judged on the internet heavily. <laughs> judged heavily on social media. So, so you know, par part of me is like, oh, Sean Kendrick is being macho by being like, oh, look at this. I it, It's like not perfect. I'm going to throw it away. But the other part of me is like, he's putting his name, he's embossing, stamping his name in that thing. And it's oh, going to yeah. live for thousands of years, literally. Some, yeah. some, you know, that blade will live for thousands of years. Uh, yeah. So, his, yeah, his I stuff get it. Is his stuff is, you know, just, yeah, I, there's, there's few, I, I like to carry my own folding knife. I, I collect fixed blades from friends and, um, and makers I look up to. And, and I enjoy carrying my own folding knife. Just, I like having an example of my work and, um, and yeah. And his, one of his knives would be one that I would enjoy carrying quite a bit. Um, yeah. So where do you see yourself on, um, are, are you, okay, so there's the riddle, uh, 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 you know, uh, what's, what has four legs at birth, or four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening, and it's man, you know, he's, he's born and he crawls, and then he's, for the most of his life, walking around on two legs, in the end, he's got a cane and he's dead. So where are you in your knife making career? Are you are you a babe in arms? Are you do you still feel? I mean, obviously, we look at your work from where we sit and we see beautiful, beautiful knives. But from where you sit and what you want out of your career, what you want to your dream knife that you're gonna make at some point, where are you on that line? We're just getting going. I mean, we're we're I'm I feel as though I've uh, established myself as a maker in this community. And I'm, I'm pretty confident in my skills and my designs, but, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're just, we're, we're just getting going. I have a lot that I want to do that I want to accomplish and leave behind. Um, and I don't even know what that is exactly, but I just, you know, I have this, this drive to just always be learning, always be better. I, you know, I want to be one of the best I want, you know, like, I don't want, I don't want to be like, yeah, Brian Elfros, he was a decent knife maker, you know, did it for a career and now he's dead. No, I, I want to be one of the fucking best, man. Um, and, and the only way that I know how to do that is just to keep learning, keep pushing yourself. You know, every knife can be cleaner than the one before. Every grind can be more crisp. Um, I, you know, I, and I, I want to do it all. I'm, I mentioned briefly that I have a, a collaboration uh, with Boker that's in the works. Um, and so working with like a, a big production company to make, you know, in inexpensive versions of my designs available to a lot of people is something, you know, I want to do. Uh, I've worked with Alliance Designs. I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with those yeah. guys, but, um, you know, and that's kind of like – a real high end uh, production type thing. And then, you know, but I never want to stop, you know, making customs. This is just, I just, I actually haven't even shipped this one out. This is the last knife I just finished right there. Oh, um, and that's, this is my elder model. Um, and yeah, I actually have to ship it out. <laughs> I have to ship it out tomorrow. That's beautiful. Um, I'll, I'll give you my address right, right after we wrap here. That is perfect. gorgeous. <laughs> no, so, kidding. so yeah, so you have literally, um, at the same time, you can see like the very first one and the uh, very most recent. Try and get them both in the screen at the same time. There we go. But uh, but yeah, I just uh, I love this man. I love making knives. I feel so lucky to be supported by the community in the way that I am. And uh, yeah. Uh, if you want to go down, it's one of the best. Well, I, I, I think I speak for a lot of us in saying that, um, you know, until we get an actual custom Brian Efros knife in hand, that uh, we're excited that there's someone who can get your designs in our hands for less money. You know, to me, no, I'm serious. Like, to me, like, that, that is a, one of the saving graces of this awesome modern knife market we have right now. Uh, if you don't have the, the scratch to the time to get a Brian Efros, 
Well, in the in the near future, you can get one from Boker and and at least experience the design and uh, and the lines and some of the experience of what you get. And to me, I think that's a great thing, and and I'm sure a lot of people want more of that. But uh, for those uh, people who want to uh, get one of your knives in hand uh, sooner, how should they reach out to you? What's the best way to find you and get your work? Um, I'm I'm currently not taking orders for book spots. Um, that that list got real big real quick and i don't feel that it's um responsible almost to ask mm -hmm. people to wait three years for a knife um i refuse to take any money up front and it just yeah i just um so unfortunately i i'm not really making uh knives for order right now the the best way if you're interested in getting one of my knives is to join my facebook group uh, it's, it's a real active place. Um, there's knives that come up on the secondary for sale. I do make knives to lotto or sell or raffle or auction, whatever, in my group. Um, and a lot of the times those knives are, you know, I, I, when I do make a lot of the knives I make, like this one, are book spots that people have been waiting for. But sometimes I just want to make a knife that I want to make. Mm -hmm. And those usually end up um either in my pocket or um most often being sold in, in the facebook group um, i do sell some on instagram but um i just like facebook better and that's that's where i do most of my uh most of my sales so so yeah and and you know and occasionally um there will be a group member who just seems like a, a nice cool person and they contribute and I'll, I'll offer them a book spot, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I'll, you know, there's just people, I'll, listen, I'm, I'm not fair. It's not, it's not, it's not. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't take, take orders right now, but if someone is interested, my Facebook group is the best place to, uh, to get your hands on one. And I would say that most people that join the group, you know, do eventually end up, scoring something i guess <laughs> well, I, don't know. I, I know yeah. what you mean about i'm not being fair i mean what you mean it, you know you only have so much capacity and and you know people people who make the effort are people who yeah you know yeah. We, all, I, we, all, we all get it i like to have fun too like for example a knife that i just made uh i, I gave a guy a book spot but i put up a, a thing in my group i wanted to get gold and i for the Nintendo 64 for my steps. And I figured he needed to experience that. <laughs> so I just put a post up in the group. Yo, does anyone have a copy of golden eye? I'll trade you for a book spot. Jeez, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, and we, we love it. We play golden eye all the time. It's totally <laughs> worth it. Um, and, and so, yeah, so someone's really uh, interested in, in checking them out, learning about them and uh, talking about, you know, knives and tacos and beer, then, uh, Man, yeah, my Facebook group is just uh, just search for the group Efros Knives. I have a business page as well, Brian Efros Knives, but don't mess with that because I haven't updated that in five years. Um, but yeah, just just the the Facebook group is where where the action goes down. Well, all right, Brian, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Uh, you know, we just scratched the surface, uh, but uh, you know, hopefully, uh, people will be. I know people know who you are and they're already looking at your stuff. I, I, I'm just afraid we didn't show enough of your knives on this here podcast, but maybe we can, we can go deeper on another one in the future, but yeah, uh, man, I'd love to talk again. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I think your work is beautiful and uh, you. You know, I admire, I admire your effort and what you're doing. So keep on thank doing you so it. much. Keep on thank doing you. it long enough for me to get one <laughs> and then you can do whatever um, you want with your life. <laughs> that sounds good, man. I like All it. Right. All right. Thank you, Brian. Take care. Cheers, man. Visit the Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Brian Efros. I've been uh, I've been drooling over his knives on Instagram for you know two years now. Really cool to meet him, and uh, and you know I, I have a feeling we'll have another conversation in the in the future because there's a lot to talk about. And I'm wondering, I wanted to ask him, and I didn't. Does he have any slip joint designs? I would love to see 
uh, what a Brian Efros slip joint looks like. Uh, but in any case, um, I think it's great that he showed off the knife that he makes that gets the most use that he knows of. And it's his wife, Anne's knife, and it goes in her bag, presumably. I don't know where it goes, but it gets banged around a lot. It gets thrown a lot around. It gets used. And uh, what, a, what a great uh, test piece. It's kind of like uh, when I've made drawings or paintings in the past, you put them on the wall, you look at them every day, and you're like, eh, a little bit off the chin. Well, he gets that chance uh, with this test bed knife. And he's one of those rare makers that actually carries his own knives. And I think that's great, too, because, you know, it's great to take uh, input from your buyers, but you know, who else can give you better input but yourself, you know, as the as the artist and the creator. Anyway, that was Brian Efros. Uh, check him out on Instagram and if you're and on his Facebook group. And that's definitely where you need to go if you want to pick up one of his knives. Uh, so for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, as usual, I am Bob DeMarco saying thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this interview and tune in next week for another great interview. Uh, that's me saying good night. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.